I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. This incredible sighting occurred in the Alberta oil fields on April 7, 2004. I was working as an emergency medical responder in the oil field, sitting on site for a gas well workover near the western end of the Red Rock Road. The job was ending due to spring breakup and road bands were partially on, preventing the moving of heavy loads during the day. At this time, the partial bands allowed heavy haul from midnight to seven in the morning. My consultant had directed that I be the last personnel to egress. The last low boy on site was having issues with tie-downs, and that delayed his departure from location until approximately 3.30 a.m. Everyone else had been off-site by 1 a.m. I held at location for 20 minutes past the last truck's departure, hoping he would stay far enough ahead of my medical unit to avoid it being peppered by rocks and frozen mud chunks, meaning I entered the Red Rock at approximately 4 a.m., heading in an easterly direction. I had been on site since 7 a.m. the previous day and was going into my 21st hour of being awake. Because of this, I was being extra careful to pay attention to both sides of the road, maintaining a speed of about 30 to 40 kilometers, hoping to give me enough reaction time to break for wildlife popping out on the road in front of me. There was a fair amount of wildlife in this area. Deer, elk, lynx, moose, black bear, and I even encountered a grizzly sow grazing grass in a ditch by the side of the road in this area the summer before. My mobile treatment center was mounted on the bed of a 2500 Dodge Ram 2004 extended cab pickup powered by a Cummings diesel. I was keeping the high beams on, the lights were illuminating the entire roadbed, the snow and ice berm, and another 10 meters on both sides of the road. I remember passing the area where the service rig's camp had been set up to the left of the road, thinking it looked pretty empty and deserted. I could make out the area because of the ambient starshine. That, along with the last few centimeters of snow on the ground, helped give shape and shadow to the snow berms, stumps, trees, and gravel patches of the parking area of the camp. A few kilometers past the rig campsite, the Red Rock does a gentle S-curve through a stand of mature timber running along both sides of the road for approximately 500 meters. After this, the Red Rock comes out on a flat area where a road branched off from the right heading south. From there, a graded left curve dropped into a wide arc at about a 4% grade to cross a single-lane temporary bridge over a creek. After crossing the bridge, the road swung in an arc to the right, climbing back out of the creek's floodplain, again at a 4% grade. I'm pretty short, 5 foot 2, and occasionally, if the grade was steep enough, I would not be able to see the road directly in front of my rig until I started to level out. Because of this, I had slowed down to about 20 kilometers per hour. As I topped the hill coming up out of the creek, and I was just about to accelerate, when a solid five-point elk came from the right side of the road, hopping over the berm and landing not four feet in front of my fender, scaring the stuffing out of me. Breaking hard, I was glad I had slowed down. I then noticed the condition of the elk. He took about two steps, coming to a full stop right in front of my rig. Looking closer at the elk, I could see that he was winded. His lip is up, almost like he's going to bugle. His antlers were laying almost parallel to the line of his back. His tongue is hanging out the side of his mouth, where it was clearly visible to me, and the eye I could see is rolled back, exposing the sclera. I'm thinking, what in the heck? It's not rut. Why would this animal be acting like this? The elk stood there for three to five seconds panting, then dropped its head into a normal walking posture. He walked slowly off to the left side of the road. My experience with elk and deer and roads has always been that if there's one, there's usually more. So before I started forward again, I did a check down both sides of the road, looking off as far as my headlights allowed, looking for any eye shine. And that's when I saw it. The Red Rock, like most gas field roads, has an 80 to 100 meter of clear cut along the right side of the road to allow for the laying in of a pipeline to carry the gas from the wells in the field to the plant. On this section of the Red Rock, the right-of-way was cleared of timber, but the tree stumps were still in place, which is the usual condition when the pipe has yet to be laid. The stumps were the grey-brown of trees that had been dead for several years. Between the starlight, the headlight, and the snow, I could identify stumps and the bottom part of tree trunks of the standing timber at the back of the clear-cut right-of-way. Finishing the scan, I had looked forward down the road, and just when I was about to drive on, I caught a motion in my peripheral vision on the right, drawing my attention back to that area. 
At first, I thought it was just a tall stump, as it appeared a bit taller than the other stump nearby. A slight breeze moved the hair of this taller stump, and it sort of shimmered like the hollow tips on a grizzly's coat in the truck's headlights. Looking closer, I now see what appears to be a round head, no face visible, and two round shoulders. The width of the shoulders had to be at least three football helmets wide, at least one meter. The bulkiness of the shoulders should have been another clue that the shape of this form was not that of a bear. This, my aha moment, and I'm now thinking I know what was making the elk run, a bear, and by its coloring, a grizzly. I feel the puzzle has been solved satisfactorily, and I start to move forward. But that's when it stands up on two legs. When I say it stands, what it does is it unfolds in a smooth and easy motion. No swaying, no side to side in the way a bear does to keep in a standing position. I'm still thinking grizzly bear. Based on its estimated distance from the side of the road, about 10 to 12 meters, the brightness of the area being lit by the high beams and how the upper part of the standing form fades into darkness, I would guesstimate the height to be about 7 to 8 feet. It turns its upper body toward the east, and even though I cannot see a face, I get the feeling it's looking further down the road in the direction I'm headed. I have the impression of a head, but it's tall enough that the upper third of the body fades into the darkness, that being only slightly a different dark than the standing timber several more meters behind the form. Thick dark bluish black for trees, and dark blackish brown for the upper part of the creature. My next surprise is when it drops its arm. The left arm is long enough that I could see the range of motion, shape, and the large shape of a hand in the light of the high beams. This is why I say arms. It was a hand and not a paw. The arm was longer and the hand was lower than where a human head would rest beside a human thigh. I'm beginning to be overwhelmed by a feeling of dis-ease, like I should not be sitting still and that I should really start driving away from this creature. My heart is racing, my hair is on end, and I think, oh my god, as I start carefully forward, half expecting to see another one step out into the road. It takes me a few minutes to think, but I believe I had just seen a Sasquatch. From the time I braked for the elk to the time I felt compelled to start driving was probably no more than 20 to 25 seconds. Two years ago, my wife and I moved to Medford, Oregon from California. We took an early retirement from our jobs in the aerospace industry. We've always had a desire to do some camping and hiking, so last summer we reserved a space at Hardish Park Campground at the Applegate Lake. We set out with our new tent trailer, and after setting up camp, we hiked the Collings Mountain Trail and visited the Bigfoot Trap. We had read a few clippings about the Sasquatch, so when we got back to camp, we spent a while in the general store inquiring as to whether this animal was real or just something to scare off us detested Californians. Several people there told us stories about seeing them in the area, and even as sincere as they sounded, we came away feeling that it may be more talk for tourists, because they regaled us with story after story about their customers who had seen the beast, and we figured they were simply trying to entertain their guests. The next day, though, we ended up with our own story. We locked up our trailer and drove south to the southern end of the lake and up the dirt road to the Oregon-California border, and then, because it just kept climbing, we turned and came back down to the end of the lake, because we wanted to hike rather than drive. We took a dirt road that said, Stein Butte Trailhead. It went up the opposite side of the lake from our campground. This was called the Manzanita Creek Road, and we followed it until it crossed Manzanita Creek, and started to swing left and around, and then to the right again up the mountain. Our desire was to do some hiking, but not up in the steep mountains. We decided to go back to where we had crossed the Manzanita Creek and hike along the creek. There was a large area on the left just before we reached the creek, so we parked there. We took our small backpacks and headed off on the trail that followed the creek. As we walked, we intersected several trails that went in slightly different directions, and we soon found ourselves on the edge of a beautiful mountain meadow with groves of trees, rocks, and just really pretty country. We stuck to the trail that stayed more in the trees as there was so little underbrush. It was such a pleasant outing and we were enjoying the solitude. Even the few boats and cars seemed to be so far away. We hadn't been in such a rich environment before and it certainly wasn't like Cali. I didn't mean to ramble, but to us this was like a wilderness adventure. About a mile or so on this trail we stopped on a sort of flat ledge that ran along and up into the higher elevations. 
but the trail split soon, and after having a snack and some water, we followed the lesser-traveled path downward. We quickly descended, and as the trail wrapped to our left, we must have been directly below the upper trail, as a few small rocks came falling down on the path ahead of us. We just assumed that it might have been another hiker, but we didn't see or hear anyone. About another fifty feet ahead, it appeared that our trail was about to end, but when we got to some rocks that were blocking it, something jumped up and leaped over the rock barrier and ran noisily down into the deepened gully on the other side. We both ran to the large rocks and climbed up so we could see over, and that's when we got a shock that stopped us cold. Expecting to see a deer, I was scrambling in my pack for the camera, but what I was looking at paralyzed me. Not so much in fear, but more in absolute awe. There, moving rapidly along the steep slope of sand and loose rock, was a shaggy brown, long-haired, two-legged animal that I couldn't even comprehend. Then, just as it entered a patch of thick forest that grew at the end of this canyon, another larger animal that looked like a tall gorilla came out of the trees, grabbed the little guy with one hand, hoisted it up onto its shoulder with a giant-looking hand, and then almost as in the same motion, threw a large piece of a log in our direction with the other hand. We had to be a hundred feet away, and yet the log sailed right up to where we were standing, and we had to jump back to avoid being hit. Naturally, my lack of outdoor experience caused me to push Carol out of the way, and then I fell flat on my face in the rocks, causing enormous embarrassment and numerous cuts and bruises. Carol and I helped each other up, and we looked at each other as if to say, Did that actually happen? Even though these creatures were more afraid of us than even seemed logical with our size differences and our obvious shortcomings in being able to walk in this type of terrain, we assumed that they were still moving up the canyon, and sensibly, we decided to retreat and hobble our way back out. We retraced our route while glancing to our back trail every few minutes until we reached the car and were able to quickly return to our campsite to wash and doctor our wounds. After cleaning up and changing out of our torn and soiled clothes, we visited the general store again, only a little more humble and confident that they had two more believers in the Bigfoot creature. We gave them a new story to add to their collection. Although we drew quite an audience of fellow campers and got our experience noted in their storybook, we had the pride of becoming true Oregonians. Thank you. Jim and Carol Longacre, Medford, Oregon. We were hiking along the Rogue River last winter along the shore near Hellgate Canyon, as this is about the only time of year when you can genuinely enjoy the beautiful Rogue without standing in line behind tourists. Seldom do we get a chance to get photos of animals with rafts floating by at ten-minute intervals and the jet boats playing at making giant waves, so we took our shepherd out for a long romp along the river. We had hiked up the river from the parking area below Hellgate, and it was threatening to rain, but a beautiful day for ducks and geese that were all over the place. We were watching to see what had stirred up a large murder of crows way upon the other side of the river. They seemed to be going absolutely nuts, so I got the camera out of my backpack while my wife managed our dog. The sun was fighting to get through the clouds, and I was straining to get focus on the spot, way up the steep mountain across the river, just to be ready for a lucky photo op of a bear or coyote, since it normally takes some bigger event to get crows that excited. They must have been anticipating a kill of some magnitude and lots of leftover meat scraps. There must have been over 30 crows, and they were all making a real racket, when all of a sudden a man ran out into the gap in the trees and on his shoulder was a small deer. Then, as I triggered the shot, I saw what I had assumed to be a man was actually a stooped-over being that resembled a large chimpanzee, so I snapped two more shots before it disappeared into the pines again. My wife had been watching the scene, and she actually saw it better, because I was busy trying to see it on my cannon's small screen, which was like looking into a light bulb for all the good it was. So I had just pointed and shot. The results? Not a chance. Just a nice sun's reflection with a few pine trees and rocks. My wife did get a chance to view the creature, and her only statement was an excited, There was a Bigfoot. We really saw a Bigfoot. Well, she did. I only saw the sun. My wife said it was hard to guess its size as the distance was probably two football fields away and up at about 45 degrees, but she guessed it must have been bigger than me as she compared it against an old fence line on the mountainside across from us, which would have made the animal well over six feet or seven feet tall. She noted it was very wide through the shoulders. 
She said she would have hated to see me tangle with it. We own a clothing store in the area, and she said we couldn't fit that guy with anything in stock. And then we jokingly agreed that I couldn't shoot a Sasquatch with a cannon. Jack T. Grants Pass, Oregon Thanks for listening. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter and would like to share your story here, please email me. My email address is thebigfootproject at mail.com. Hope to hear from you soon.